Let me go back to the early days of compact disc. Back in the 1980s, digital audio was considered to be a good thing. But how would you know if your digital CD was contaminated with analogue? Analogue noise, analogue distortion, analogue wow and flutter, to name but three of the numerous features of analogue. People did worry about this. They worried that the CD they bought was not recorded, mixed and mastered using entirely digital means. So, in 1984, the Society of Professional Audio Recording Services, SPARS we can call them, devised a three-character code that could be displayed on the booklet or tray card of a CD, so that potential purchasers could know exactly how their music was produced. Credit to SPARS for making things simple. We all know how complicated food labelling can be. So the code, D equals digital, A equals analogue, as simple as that. Highest in ranking in the sparse scale was DDD. The first D shows that the original recording was made digitally. For classical music, the original recording could be stereo. For popular music, then usually multi-track. The second D refers to mixing. Classical music recorded in stereo doesn't need mixing, but further sweetening could be applied, and editing would have to be done digitally for the D to be correct. The third D refers to mastering, which in the olden days was mostly the technical process of preparing the recordings from which CDs would be manufactured. There could be some tweaking of the audio, matching of album tracks for frequency balances and levels, and cross-fading. The loudness war hadn't started, and some would say that mastering was in its golden age. But I digress. So, a DDD CD would be digitally recorded, digitally mixed and digitally mastered. On a CD, the last character of the code was always D, because the compact disc is inherently digital. The sparse code is simple, and of course, simplicity can obscure fine details, but this would be a topic for another video. Today, I want to explore vinyl, where obviously what the listener hears is pure A, analogue, and we can match this to the sparse code. So let's suppose that an artist or band records an album. They want to please their fans, many of whom they know to be die-hard analogists, analogites, analogophiles. <laughs> there must be a word for them. Oh yes, and the band's management would never let a good marketing opportunity go to waste. So they decide to produce the album entirely analog, analogly, analogish. Their normal fans who listen on streaming services don't care, and it doesn't matter. But their vinyl fans most definitely do and there are always marketing opportunities in the music press and trade magazines for analogue. So they record on a Studer A820 multitrack, mixed to a Studer, also A820 stereo machine, and the mastering for vinyl is done in a studio that has a special mastering stereo tape recorder with an advanced preview playback head. The output from this is used to control the spacing of the grooves, and other than that, has no influence on the audio. <laughs> but then along came Ampex with the ADD-1, a digital delay designed specifically to remove the need for the preview head. The best I can find regarding dates is 1973, but if you have definitive information on this, like a dated magazine ad, please let us know in the comments. The process goes like this. Mount the master tape on a regular stereo machine, not a special one with a preview head, because you don't need it, the signal from the playback head goes to the computer, an analog computer, controlling the pitch of the grooves. The signal to be cut into the lacquer goes through the digital delay. Let me say this again and make it clear. The best, most original, most analog signal from the playback head is used to control groove spacing and nothing else. The signal cut into the lacquer has been converted to digital, delayed, then converted back again. So going back to my hypothetical artist or band, they wanted to make analog records for their vinyl fans. They recorded A, mixed A, and they thought they were going to master A. Analog, analog, analog. But in the supposedly analog vinyl mastering stage, a sneaky digital delay has snuck in. I can't find a specification sheet for the Ampex ADD-1, but I used digital delays in the 1980s that were 12-bit, with gain range switching to extend that to 15 bits, or a theoretical signal-to-noise ratio of 90 dB, but the actual resolution of the audio was just 12 bits. Compare that to the 16 bits of CD, or 24 bits of modern digital recording. So I very much doubt that the ADD-1 was anything better than 12-bit, perhaps even less. 
I could be wrong, of course, and I would welcome a reliable source on this. Of course, digital delay is now mature, and there wouldn't be any reason not to use 24-bit, 96 kilohertz, or even 192 kilohertz. But it's still digital. So now we get into points of philosophy, like if the Pope in the woods, does it make a sound? <laughs> what is absolutely not a point of philosophy is that if you're selling something and you describe it incorrectly in your marketing materials, in the UK we have the Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Regulations, which can be enforced with a fine or imprisonment. I don't think that anyone using a digital delay rather than analog preview is going to be thrown in choky, but I would presume that a fine, compensation, destruction of offending materials really ought to be enough of a deterrent. OK, so that's that. But the question is whether AAA is an adequate description of AA, digital delay, A. And if sparse terminology is not used, is it OK to describe such a recording as completely analogue, or even analogue at all? I wouldn't find it hard to imagine that there are many audio files out there who would regard one drop of digital contamination as being the same as the whole thing being digital. But as I said, it's philosophical. There is one area where analogue was most definitely superior to digital, and that was frequency response. In the days of CD standard 16-bit 44.1 kHz sampling, the upper frequency response was limited to 20 kHz because of the filtering needed before the ultimate barrier of the Nyquist frequency, which is half the sampling rate, or just over 22 kHz. Well, old-fashioned analogue tape recorders could easily exceed this. The Ampex ATR100 running at 30 inches per second is specified to be only 2 decibels down at 28 kHz. And whatever the published specification of a tape recorder, because analogue doesn't need steep filtering like digital does, there is useful output beyond the published figures. Getting hold of figures for the frequency response of a vinyl cutting lathe has been surprisingly more difficult than I expected. But word on the internet from people who seem as though they know what they're talking about is that the best lathes with the best cutter heads, a cutting head if you prefer, can be flat up to 20 kHz with useful output up to 25 kHz. If you have an actual spec sheet for a Neumann or Scully lathe, or something of equal quality, let me know and I'll update this in a future video. Anyway, I'd bet a bottle of Prosecco that a decent lathe can achieve higher frequencies than 44.1 kHz digital audio. And the classic Shure V15 Mark III cartridge from somewhere quite distant in the past can also go up to 25 kHz in the specs. So I'll stick with that for now. But hardly anyone can hear that high anyway, so why does it matter? Well. It matters firstly because some people can, but also because if we take a stance and say that the accepted limit of human hearing is 20 kHz, I'd say we need a decent safety margin above that, and cutting off sharp at 20 kHz, as in CD standard digital audio, may work in practice, but really, when something's not right, it's just not right. So using a digital delay rather than the preview head does mean that something is getting lost. Or at least, it used to get lost, because digital audio can easily match analogue for frequency response now. So maybe it was an issue in years gone by, but we're living in today, not yesterday. Some will argue, however, that there's something intrinsically wrong with cutting up continuous, smoothly flowing analogue audio into discrete levels measured at discrete time intervals, and then piecing it back together again like a new version of Frankenstein's monster. Yes, it seems all wrong. I would counter-argue, however, that it's no more wrong than taking real sound travelling in air, then converting it to electricity, then converting it into a wiggly groove in a piece of plastic. Oh yes, with a detour into the domain domains of magnetism in between. Digitising audio is surely no more wrong than any of these processes. And digital recording can be, really can be, just one process. So it's digital audio that's more pure. The purest of the inevitably impure, if you like. So I've spun this 180 degrees. I'll spin again, probably into a different dimension, and say that magnetic tape recording and vinyl records are probably not the ultimate form of analogue recording. Analogue technology peaked in the 1980s. OK, turntables have made small but useful advances after that. But if digital audio had never been invented, surely someone would have come up with a better way of recording analogue in the studio and delivering it into the home. Better than tape recorders, 
better than vinyl. That was a bit of a tangent, but I want to show that I'm not anti-analogue, I'm pro-digital. What I'm not pro, however, is saying that a record is analogue, 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 AAA, when there has been a digital stage in mastering. I respect analogue enthusiasts and I feel that they're being let down. It should be made crystal clear when a record is full AAA. Let's call it AAAA. And when mastering involves a digital stage, it's merely AADA. What do you think? Let us all know in the comments. See you soon.